December 23, 2013, the 49ers hosted the Falcons. This was a much anticipated matchup of the previous year's NFC Championship. But more importantly, this was the 49ers' final game ever at Candlestick Park. The Stick was one of America's most iconic stadiums, and it's where this franchise built their legacy. It was time to go out with a bang. Like these two plays, this game went back and forth. Ultimately, the 49ers looked to have the edge late in the fourth, as long as they recovered this onside kick. They will go for the onside kick here. He goes down the sideline, Snelling. Was he able to stay in bounds? Yes, he did. <laughs> As the Falcons drew closer and closer to the end zone, it looked like the final memory for Niners fans at the stick would be the football bouncing right past Navarro Bowman. But instead, this is what happened. Pressure coming, Ryan gets rid of it for Douglas, it's fought for, and it's in the hands of Bowman, who's got all green grass. Navarro Bowman, gonna take the Niners to the playoffs. Welcome back to 2013. Let me refresh your memory. Do you remember Tim Tebow on the Patriots? What about Peyton Manning's legendary season? How many of you waited in line like me for the release of the PS4 and Next Gen Madden? Overall, the NFL in 2013 was a wild time. And in 2023, the season's already off to an epic start. You can get tickets today to go watch your favorite teams, courtesy of SeatGeek. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports, festivals, and more. And with football season right around the corner, you gotta go check out a game. And SeatGeek's got you covered. They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure that you're getting a good deal. Each ticket is rated on a scale from one to 10, so look for the green dots, with green meaning good and red meaning bad. And every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee. And SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know I came through for you guys. Use my code KTO for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code KTO. Make sure to click the link in the description to download the app. The 2013 draft can be summarized by the following. Number one, there wasn't a ton of excitement at the time considering the lack of skill position players at the top of the draft. The most notable names in the first round to the average fan was wide receiver Stavon Austin, DeAndre Hopkins, and Cordero Patterson, as well as Florida State quarterback EJ Manuel. And number two, going along with that last player I mentioned, compared to the 2012 quarterback class, 2013 was considerably weaker. After four guys went in the first round in 2012, EJ Manuel was the only quarterback drafted in the first round in 2013, and there were only three quarterbacks total taken in the first three rounds. The most notable trades in the offseason included the Chiefs acquiring Alex Smith from the Niners. But there's no denying that Alex Smith has been a welcomed addition to the Kansas City Chiefs. The Seahawks received Percy Harvin from the Vikings. And Darrell Rivas, who was the consensus number one corner in the league before getting injured in 2012, was sent by the Jets to the Buccaneers. As far as free agency, the biggest moves were Wes Welker leaving New England for Denver, Elvis Doomerville going from the Broncos to the Ravens, and lastly, James Harrison had moved from the Steelers to their division rival, the Bengals. Now off the field, there were a few big moments that garnered media attention. Number one, the infamous tuck rule was finally abolished. It had come into rule in 1999 and cost the Raiders a chance at playing in the Super Bowl. Number two, Eagles wide receiver Riley Cooper was caught on video using a racial slur during a music concert and was briefly sent away from the team. Once again, I'm, uh, I'm extremely sorry. Number three, there was a $765 million settlement proposal based around concussions announced in a class action lawsuit brought against the league by former players. They knew about it and they didn't tell us. You know, that's just like flat out lying to you. Number four, there was the release of Madden 25 and NCAA 14. Sadly, this was the final year of the college football game's release. A few months after Madden was released on PS3 and Xbox 360, the next generation of consoles dropped. 
The much anticipated release of the next version of Madden featured Adrian Peterson on the cover. The name Madden 25 was meant to celebrate the game's 25th anniversary, but it did leave this question. And for the last off the field moment that I'll mention, Patriots tight end Aaron Hernandez was charged with murder. The news of his arrest was much bigger than football, but for the sake of this video, we will keep focus on the NFL and use this moment to transition into preseason storylines. In what can be described as a media circus, the Aaron Hernandez news was the bomb that dropped on an already heavily covered training camp. Here's a brief rundown of the major stories. March 13th, the Patriots lost Wes Welker, who had made five Pro Bowls in a row to the Broncos. I mean, you pull out all stops, and Wes, we're gonna throw it every time. You don't have to block. Everything is on the table. June 10th, they brought in Tim Tebow, one of the most publicized players of that era. And just over two weeks later, the Patriots released Hernandez after his arrest. When you heard about Aaron Hernandez, what, what you thought, what your reaction was? Uh, next question. Due to a combination of free agency, injuries, and off the field matters, the Patriots began camp without their top seven pass catchers from 2012. Now, other than the Patriots, here's the other big storylines prior to the 2013 regular season. Number two, the Denver Broncos shocked everybody after going a league best 13 and three in 2012. And after the signing of Wes Welker, the Broncos shot up to the best Super Bowl odds of any team in the league. It was clear that Manning was gonna do whatever it took to get over the hump. Moving on to number three, it was year two of the 2012 quarterbacks. Entering their second seasons, how would they fare? Luck led one of the greatest turnarounds in NFL history in 2012. Luck downfield, touchdown! But could he clean up his high turnover numbers? RG3 was the rookie of the year, but after suffering a torn ACL in the team's final playoff game, could he bounce back from that serious injury? And for Russell Wilson, with an already dominant defense that got stronger in the offseason, as well as acquiring the high-profile Percy Harvin, what was this team led by this young quarterback going to look like in 2013? Excited yesterday when they... Oh, yeah. That's, that's a huge move. I mean, who, I mean, it's even more huge from a Madden game. Roger Goodell lowering the boom on the New Orleans Saints and their bounty program. Goodell suspended Sean Payton, the head coach, for a full season. After Bountygate led Sean Payton to being suspended and out of the NFL for the 2012 season, he returned to the Saints' sideline. So how was this year off going to affect him? The day he was back in, in the start of April, it was, hey, we're, we're right back at it. And how was their new look defense with Rob Ryan going to fare? Number five, after 14 seasons, Andy Reid was out as the Eagles head coach and was now coaching the Chiefs. Kansas City had struggled mightily in recent years, and one of the first moves they made after Reed was hired was the trade for former number one pick, Alex Smith. Now for the Eagles, their replacement for Andy Reed was the most sought after college coach in the country, the innovative Chip Kelly. With Mike Vick, LaShawn McCoy, and Deshaun Jackson, some of the shiftiest players in the game, imagining them in Kelly's up-tempo offense was incredibly intriguing, and many of us were eager to see how these changes would play out. And lastly, the reigning Super Bowl champion Baltimore Ravens set out to defend their title, but with a drastically different look. Legends Ed Reed and Ray Lewis were amongst eight defensive starters that were no longer on the roster. So how would the defending champs fare with all these defensive changes? Okay, next up, to give a little context to the state of all 32 franchises, we will look at the projections of each conference by itself. Let's start with the NFC. On screen, we have how each team fared in 2012, how many wins they were projected to have in 2013, and who was their starting quarterback or quarterbacks during the season. The Western Division was a juggernaut with their top two teams, the Seahawks and the Niners, who each possessed young quarterbacks and elite defenses. Both of these teams were seen as Super Bowl contenders. Going up north, it was the Packers' division to lose. And in the south, the Falcons, who had gone 13-3 in 2012, were looking to maintain control over the Saints, who had gotten their head coach Sean Payton back. Then lastly, the East was a complete toss-up. No single team looked spectacular or terrible on paper. Now switching conferences to the AFC, out West, the Broncos looked like the strongest team by far after acquiring Wes Welker. In the North, it was going to be a dogfight, minus the dogs themselves. 
Down south, Houston with Matt Schaub were looking to take the division once again, but the Colts with Luck in his second year were on the rise. And finally, as close as it gets to a guarantee in the NFL, the Patriots were heavy favorites to win the East yet again, even with all their offseason drama. As for Tim Tebow, they did release him during final cuts, which led him to beginning his broadcasting career a few months later. Entering the regular season, here was the NFL top 10 players according to other players, and also here's what the average first round draft looked like in fantasy football. That run in week 12 by Scott Tolzien was pretty much the only highlight of his career. He was even benched later in that very game. But anyways, going to the beginning of the 2013 regular season, things got off to a record-breaking start right away in Denver. And airing it out, and a fingertip catch, Demarius Thomas, touchdown. It's a trade that Jim Ursay is mentioning on Twitter. You may not believe this, but Trent Richardson has been traded to the Indianapolis Colts. For an season, Alex Smith hit as he throws. Still connecting the ball, who's on his feet, breaks the tackle, and he's in for six. What a wild story. What began as a common ingrow toenail turned into a nightmarish case of MRSA. And this morning, Tynes fully blames the Bucks for the infection and even claims the team tried to hide it. In week six, three Tampa Bay Bucks players were diagnosed with a potentially deadly strain of staff. The NFL nearly canceled their home game that week because of it. The following week, the Falcons even took the step of bringing in a hazardous materials crew to disinfect the visitors' locker room after the Bucks visited Atlanta in week seven. New developments in another big story in professional football, accusations that a Miami Dolphins player quit because he was bullied by members of his own team. And now the team is taking action. Overnight, the Miami Dolphins suspended starting guard Richie Incognito amidst allegations he may have harassed and even bullied teammate Jonathan Martin so badly that Martin left the team. Richie Incognito didn't play the rest of that season, and he sat out all of 2014. Also, the Dolphins offensive line coach Jim Turner played a role in some of the abuse, and he was fired shortly after the report's release. Okay, now let's head back to the football side of things. In weeks seven and eight, there were four records set, and Calvin Johnson had 329 receiving yards in a single game. Although this wasn't a record, it was definitely worth mentioning. Nick Foles out of nowhere threw seven touchdowns in a game. It's wild because he started the year as a backup, and he went on to make the Pro Bowl in 2013. Week 11, at 9-0, the Chiefs played the 8-1 Broncos, and Denver prevailed. Zone for the, oh, it's caught by Gordon. He's over 200 yards. This has never happened back-to-back -back in the history of pro football. For the all-time mark from 64, Matt Prater's kick is good. He's got it away. Michael coming on a blitz play. Pass to Thomas, and it's Keekley again. Part of the reason he's winning because of this. Dre Kirkpatrick. I'll Dre take that made a play. You. Dre made a play. So in wrapping up the 2013 season, here's how every team finished compared to their preseason projections. Looking first at the NFC, the Seattle Seahawks reigned supreme, taking home the number one seed with the most dominant defense in the league. For the rest of the conference, the biggest overperformers were the Cardinals, Eagles, and Panthers. The Cardinals were expected to be really bad, but they surprised everybody and just barely missed the playoffs. Considering the Eagles had Vic dealing with injuries and only starting six games, what Chip Kelly did with Nick Foles was incredible. Foles finished number one in passer rating, and they had the fourth best offense in the league. For the Panthers, Cam bounced back after a down year in 2012, but the defense was the biggest change. They went from 18th to second in scoring defense. Keekley was named Defensive Player of the Year in his second season, and Ron Rivera won Coach of the Year. 
Now, the biggest underperformers were the Falcons and Redskins. After reaching the NFC title the year before, injuries plagued the Falcons, including star wide receiver Julio Jones only playing in five games. For the Redskins, RG3 was a shell of his 2012 self. The 2013 Redskins were also notable for having one of the worst special teams units in league history. Moving over to the AFC, the Peyton Manning-led Denver Broncos took the number one seed and were truly in a league of their own offensively. 37.9 points per game, which was more than 10 points a game above second place. Manning went on to win MVP with the greatest regular season stats in NFL history for a quarterback. For the biggest overperformers in the AFC, that would be the Chiefs. Alex Smith made his first Pro Bowl of his career after eight seasons with the Niners, and Andy Reid finished second in Coach of the Year voting. Now, for the underperformers, that would go to the Houston Texans. What's absolutely wild was they started 2-0. Game number one saw Matt Schaub lead a 28-7 comeback win, the largest in Texans history. Then they had another comeback victory in week two, only to lose their last 14 games. Matt Schaub had gone from 2012 Pro Bowler to throwing a pick six in four consecutive games, an NFL record. The defense also woefully underperformed, and head coach Gary Kubiak was fired mid-season. For the last thing I'll mention prior to the playoffs, this was the greatest scoring season for the league as a whole, with games averaging 46.8 points per game. This made it the highest average in NFL history. And also, here was the top 10 passers, rushers, and receivers, according to yards, in 2013. Pretty crazy to see Josh Gordon leading the receivers, despite missing two games. The 2013-2014 playoffs kicked off with a bang. The first wildcard matchup was a record-setting showing between the Chiefs and Colts. The Chiefs jumped out to a 38-10 lead early in the second half, and somehow, someway, Andrew Luck led a staggering comeback to win 45-44. The next game also came down to the wire. The Eagles made a 13-point comeback and took the lead over the Saints with a Zach Ertz touchdown with less than five minutes to go. But after a horse collar penalty on the kickoff, the Saints didn't have to go too far to set up the game-winning kick, which they made. Surprisingly, the Bengals outgained the Chargers in yards, but they ended up losing by three scores, thanks to four turnovers and two failed fourth down attempts. And the final wildcard matchup was a classic. The duel between Rodgers and Kaepernick went back and forth. In a tied ball game with five minutes to go, the Niners put together a 65-yard drive and kicked the game-winning field goal. In the divisional round, Number one seed Seattle showed the Saints just how insane their defense was. They didn't give up any points until the fourth quarter, but despite a two touchdown lead late, the Saints scored, then recovered an onside kick after Golden Tate bobbled the ball. The Saints had a chance to tie things up, but after Colston caught this pass, he basically had two choices, step out of bounds or do this. The Seahawks won. After that amazing comeback in the wild card, the Colts were dominated by the Patriots. Four interceptions were forced, they had 234 rushing yards and six rushing touchdowns in their 43-22 victory. After falling behind early, the Niners defense stifled Cam Newton the rest of the game. They sacked him four times and they had two interceptions, which helped lead the Niners to scoring 17 unanswered and punching their ticket to face Seattle in the NFC Championship. And for the last divisional matchup, the Broncos offense wasn't as spectacular as people thought, but they did jump out to a 17-0 lead, mostly highlighted by their defense. With a 17-point lead late, the Broncos held on for the victory. Conference Championship Week This really felt like we had the best four teams in football left. The NFC matchup had the most dominant defenses, and the AFC had the top two quarterbacks in the league. The first game played was the AFC title match. Crazy enough, this was the first time in eight years that the Patriots played on the road in the playoffs. For the second straight game, it was Denver's defense who pulled out all the stops. Also, their offense put up over 500 yards and jumped out to a 20-point lead in the fourth quarter. This was enough to hold off Tom Brady, and this meant that Manning's second year in Denver was now featuring him in the Super Bowl. This made him the third quarterback ever to start in a Super Bowl for two different teams. In the NFC title game, there was so much tension between these two division rivals before kickoff that they literally had a line of officials blocking them from interacting with each other before the game. From the opening play, it was big moment after big moment. From crazy runs by Kaepernick, 
to Russell Wilson bombs. And defensively, this game was truly magnificent. Ultimately, it came down to one play with less than 30 seconds to go. And Richard Sherman made the play of his career. Broken up, picked off! This game is over! Post game, Richard Sherman went on to have his famous rant. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're gonna get. Don't you ever talk about me. As we welcome you back for the kickoff of Super Bowl 48. This was exactly the kind of matchup you hope for as an NFL fan. A record-setting offense versus a record-setting defense. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? We were about to find out. It's snapped over the head of Peyton Manning. A flag is down and the ball's out of the back of the end zone. In truly shocking fashion, one of the best offenses most of us had ever seen did the unthinkable. And from that moment, they were completely out of rhythm. On the opposite sideline, the already confident Seahawks had smelt blood and absolutely punished the Broncos in every way. In one of the largest blowouts in Super Bowl history, the Legion of Boom had taken over the NFL. The nail in the coffin was the kickoff to begin the second half. Percy Harvin to this point had been pretty much forgotten about. This poor dude had injured his hip in the offseason, which required surgery, and he missed all but one regular season game. He came back for the playoffs, but to this point, hadn't done much of anything. Then, he did this. Against his former team, the Vikings, and they just pop it up. Good kick by Prater on a hop, it's Harvin, but now he takes off, and Percy Harvin gets free! Percy Harvin! 